Welcome everybody, today's episode of the EF Show is about the previous mentioned problem that we have with global warming. In the last episode, uh, I referenced the hole in the ozone layer, and that it was created from the pollution of the greenhouse gas kind of burning a hole in the atmosphere. Um, and the, this atmosphere protects us, so that's a big problem that there is a hole in it to begin with. Not to mention the fact that it's been getting bigger. And this year, actually, it's gotten smaller, but it, that's a, a very uh, rare trend that has happened. But overall, in the past years, it has actually gotten bigger. So not only today are we going to be talking about CO2 and what effect it has in our atmosphere and urban heat bubbles, but the uh, ozone and the uh, actual atmosphere itself. So let's dive into this. There are five layers that we take for granted. We will look from the ground up, so the surface to the most outer reach of Earth's atmosphere. So looking at the first layer is the troposphere. This layer's altitude is from the surface to 10 kilometers, 33,000 feet high. So we obviously live there, we humans do. Um, nearly all weather occurs in this lowest layer. Most clouds appear here mainly because 99% of water vapor in the atmosphere is found in the troposphere. That's from ucar.com. The second layer is a stratosphere. Starting at 10 kilometers, it tops out at a whopping 50 kilometers. That is five times taller than the troposphere. The ozone layer is found within the stratosphere. Ozone molecules uh, in this layer absorb high energy ultraviolet light from the sun, converting the UV energy into heat. The stratosphere actually gets warmer the higher you go. That trend of rising temperatures with altitude means that air in the stratosphere lacks the turbulence and updrafts of the troposphere beneath it. So going to the third layer, we have the mesosphere. From 50 to 85 kilometers high. Most meteors burn up in the, atm in the atmosphere that is qualified as the mesosphere. Unlike the stratosphere, temperatures once again grow colder as you rise through the mesosphere. The coldest temperatures in Earth's atmosphere, about negative 90 degrees Celsius or negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit, are found near the top of this layer. So going to the fourth layer, we have the thermosphere. The height of it is interesting. It starts at 85 kilometers and can extend anywhere between 500 and 1,000 kilometers of, from Earth's surface. So many satellites actually orbit Earth within the thermosphere. The aurora, the northern lights, and the southern lights occur in the thermosphere. So let's stop there for a second and look into this a little bit. So something interesting, you know, you think about how, you know, satellites are around Earth, and you think about how far out they are and everything. So to think that they're actually in this layer of our atmosphere is kind of amazing because they're pretty far out there. So Earth's atmosphere extends quite a bit. And that's actually why we can uh, be protected and stay safe and have a good environment with good temperatures is not only because of the Goldilocks zone, is, which is where we are compared to our sun, it allows the heat to be just right for life, and it allows uh, there to be just enough coolness so it's not too hot, not too cold. It's a story of Goldilocks, you know, with uh, three bears, and that whole story about the, how the one was just right, that's what Earth is. So we need a thick atmosphere to protect us from all this stuff. So where it mentioned that meteors burn up here is actually, that's a protection kind of self-defense that Earth has, so it's um, it won't get destroyed. Now, back whenever Earth was first being you know formed and created, you hear about the stories of Earth getting battered like our moon is, with tons of craters and everything. And something interesting, uh, our moon actually was created because of an impact with Earth. So looking at it, in my opinion, it is the Pacific Ocean that took this hit because it is so deep. The Marianas Trench is there, and that, that'll be for a whole other episode about the moon being created. But it's quite interesting to think about the, uh, you know... How Earth was once, you know, battered and had all these holes in it, giant craters, and how now we're just living on it like, I mean, you don't see too many big craters. There's one in Arizona, and you'll see how big it is and everything, but you don't see those all over Earth. But to think back at the beginning, that's how Earth was created. So the fact that our th atmosphere is created now to protect us, we don't have those same effects. We don't have the same ones that, are, that you know kill the dinosaurs and everything. We have that layer of protection that has been produced over time. Now, it's not to say that we won't get hit by one. 
I mean, a pr plenty big enough one won't be dissolved in the Earth's atmosphere, won't burn off you know, if it's an asteroid, but it will just hit, and that, that's what we talk about in the movies and things, when you see ones wiping out cities, countries, and even the world, is these massive ones. Now, anything from what I've been able to see and read recently, anything from probably the size of a bus down will burn up. But if it's much bigger than that, that's where we have a problem because it is unpredictable. On um, it, it has so many different um, possibilities that it could either burn up, it could get smaller, it can even grow in size, it could collect stuff, it could hit satellites and things. So not only do we have a problem with you know it could be too big, we start adding in all these other problems that aren't considered before. So that's where these layers of the atmosphere are really our uh, saviors really with this because we don't have anything to protect us other than that so that's what allows earth to be saved every single time uh, and a meteor comes and tries to attack us so the fourth layer is a thermosphere and I think I already read that. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, many satellites. Uh, I am losing myself today. Uh, the fifth layer is the exosphere. From here, the top of each layer is all wonky. So the bottom is anywhere from 500 to 1,000 as listed before. To the top can actually uh, vary in altitude from 100,000 to 190,000 kilometers. That distance is actually uh, halfway to the moon. So, you know, the moon is uh, orbiting around Earth and everything, and, you know, it, that's actually in kind of our atmosphere in a way, because it's being pulled in by our own gravity, so in, I mean, halfway there, if you extend much further than that and add on a few layers, you will get there eventually to the moon. So there's not much there, but it actually uh, has, there have been some studies that have been shown that uh, Earth's atmosphere has some protection with the moon. It gives the moon a tiny atmosphere so that's why the moon is just obliterated anytime a big thing comes and hits it is because you know everything has its own gravity and you know this atmosphere can help push that away so uh, some experts consider the thermosphere the uppermost layer of our atmosphere others consider the exosphere to be the actual final frontier of earth's gaseous envelope uh air in the exosphere is a uh, constantly and though very gradually leaking out air in Earth's atmosphere into space. The ionosphere is a series of regions in parts of the mesosphere and thermosphere where high energy radiation from the sun has knocked electrons loose from their parent atoms and molecules. The electrically charged atoms and molecules that are formed this way are called ions. You hear about that in chemistry class um, and that's what gives the ionosphere its name. So the last part of the atmosphere, whether it's considered or not, um, is different than the rest. That is because it isn't even really a layer, it's not considered by many. Rather than uh, being part of the atmosphere where radiation takes over the show, the, the final reaches of Earth's atmosphere is the ionosphere, and all the previous information there are from UCAR. So it's a much it's a much different situation there. You, at the very, it's just the final reach. Any extra energy that is being pushed out, kind of protecting us from that, and that's what allows you know so many little ones to burn up that early. We don't even get to. I mean, we te we detect them, but we don't have to worry about them hitting us. Is because there's such a long way to fall. And that's where the moon is and everything. You can vary in there. And that's there's not even really a calculated distance with that. That's just however long the energy strands out. And a good example of this on a massive scale is the, uh, you know, the solar field um, where the Voyagers and them left a few years ago. They had to leave uh, any reaches of solar energy. So that's where the sun has an impact on any body, celestial body, so that could be a satellite or anything, the last reach of any energy. So they they had left that, and now they're continuing on forever and ever and ever to find, hopefully, some other form of life, if that is out there. But back to the whole Earth thing. Well, the way Earth's atmosphere works is everything, including gravity, has an effect on another. So, uh, theoretically, Earth's gravity reaches to the next star. Every single, the moon's gravity reaches Jupiter. Earth's gravity affects the sun, and obviously the sun's gravity affects the Earth. But it is such a little amount that the Earth, or the moon, or even you and me, have enough gravity to affect another planet. It's so small that theoretically it is still there, but you can't prove it. 
I mean, you can you can scale it down to a factor of okay. So if this has a certain, if this has X Y Z, then you know A B C will be affected on the other planet. So you're comparing two things on a massive scale, and applying that same logic down at the micro scale. So at micro scale, that could be possible, but it'll be interesting to see if someday that if we have any uh, confirmed information on that. And that'd be kind of cool to think, you know, if you consider you have an effect on other planets. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting, studying that and reading about that. So it's kind of a whole other side of uh, it's theoretical physics that, um, you know, it's, it's a whole field that just studies. I mean, there's some things, magnification, you know, there's uh, gravity. There are entire jobs that just study that um, exact question. And, you know, sometimes there aren't any answers, but you can find out so much about other things by looking for a certain answer. So after the short break, we'll discuss urban heat islands and how um, they are affecting your weather in the cities. So did you know that the EF show is available on Apple Podcasts now? Yes, we are available almost everywhere podcasts are available. We um, started out with Anchor, and it is a great podcasting thing. This is not a sponsor, but we uh, highly encourage you go check it out if you are curious in starting a podcast. But we were looking at a few uh, good resources to get our podcast spread out, and we saw Anchor, so we gave it a try. And so we have we are now on Google Podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts, we're on iHeartRadio, we are on quite a few other resources. Of course, if you're listening to this on YouTube, that is a uh, independent thing that we decided to upload there. But uh, we will have a video version out for you soon. So yeah, it's uh, super exciting that we have uh, so many different resources now. So uh, we are on Twitter also at the EF Show and Instagram, and so you can check us out for uh, more daily updates and things, some cool information, uh, and some really good uh, posts, and yeah, just some good meteorology, science, astronomy, you know, all that stuff, uh, all in one place. And yeah, so we do have some information about our website that is going to be coming out in 2020. So we have updated it some more, and we have added a blog page, which will include all of the Instagram and Twitter posts that will be posted in the future on it. So whenever we go to post this whole website, it will have all of them already preloaded on there. So it will be updated every week, so you can check out. We will um, be able to update it, and we will give more information around the uh, Christmas announcement time, and we will be able to uh, update that every week so you get new content and new information, and hopefully... Um, within a month of getting uh, all the information on there and data, we can start having it live update itself. So as you find posts on Twitter, you can also go on the website and see them there all in one place. So super exciting information and super exciting news. So let's get back to the podcast. So you've probably heard of the urban heat island. So the temperature in and near a city is hotter than outside the suburbs. So you've heard it referred to on the Weather Channel before, you've seen it on TV, about how it's a little bit hotter in the cities. It could be like, you know, anywhere between 5 and 10 degrees in the summer. And they talk about, you know, heat strokes and that type of thing and staying hydrated if you're in the cities. And they give some great examples at night, because nighttime you could really see this. So in the city, it can be, let's for example, let's just say 100. And in a city 20 miles away, that is a suburb, it could be 80. So that's a 20 degree difference. Um, and their urban heat island is created for a few reasons. One, the CO2 um, created by cars and machines. Not only are temperatures changed because of it, but the weather itself can be changed. You've seen it before. You know, a big storm goes into a city, pops out the other side, nothing. Or the other way around. It could be a little tiny rain cell and it blows up as it hits the city in the summer. So National Geographic defines a heat island as an urban heat island, or UHI, as a metropolitan area that, ha- that is a lot warmer than its rural areas surrounding it. And also later in the same article, citing that heat is created by energy from all people, cars, and buses. It is also created by buildings and even down to you walking in the street. Friction and everything, little tiny things are creating heat, and that all adds up. So, nighttime temperatures in uh, heat islands remain high. This is because building sidewalks and parking lots block heat coming from the ground from rising into the cloud night sky. Cloud night sky. Cold night sky, where uh, clouds may actually hold it in. Because heat is trapped in the lower levels, the temperature is warmer. 
Urban heat islands can have worse air and water quality than their rural neighbors, often having lower air quality because there are more pollutants. Now that's from nationalgeographic.org. So looking at that, you know, you see the pollutants and everything. A great example is by factories and where industry is. And that's something that started back in the Industrial Revolution, where factories started to become more steam. And steam is what really kicked this all off. It is the CO2 and everything. That's all from steam engine-powered factories, boats, um, and really the whole uh, factory business is what started this. And it's not a problem because, you know, those are great. They have changed the world. It's just that there are better ways that we could be doing it and the fact that we are still doing it the same way we have in the past and there are so many new ways that we can do it that it is safer for our environment it's archaic it's very old so i mean it is expensive to get the new modern ways in but honestly go wind power go solar power you look back at some of the, you know on the old movies and things from old westerns you see little windmills that people have that can help power things and I mean, that's that's perfect. I mean, all you need is a little tiny windmill or some solar pa uh, solar panes and stuff. So uh, you, know, you see solar fields and they power entire cities. You see a wind turbine and it powers that entire little town there. And so I think it's awesome that we have so many different ways to do it. It's just that the big cities need to start integrating these too. We look to be modern, but if we really want to be modern, then let's look at into the future at what will help our environment and there's only so much time we have to reverse stuff and there's so many different problems right now that starting out with this starting out with our air quality can really help and looking at it i mean it's a no-brainer let's just i mean give it a try i mean if it doesn't work we can look at other things but i mean steam is a very old uh, idea and we have abandoned steam boats we've abandoned steam powered cars and things now we're down to electric electric is the future and you can produce electric in so many uh, better uh, environmentally safe ways and you know it doesn't expire it doesn't go anywhere you can't dump it out it doesn't like burn anything it's just right there it's you can contain it in a battery it's perfect and so along with warmer weather, we look at hotter years. And, you know, you see these hotter years and records. You always see them. Chicago, Nashville, Montgomery, uh, Tampa, Orlando, all the way around. You could see uh, Atlanta, all these big cities. You never really see a tiny town in the middle of anywhere. I mean, you see, you could maybe see like Myrtle Beach or someplace like that. But you never see a good example. Um, you never see... Tulsa, Oklahoma on that list. I mean, sometimes you see it on some like record lows or maybe some record highs, but you don't see them on the top records. You don't see them 50 degrees above average. You don't see them 100, 100 degrees every single day for 200 and some days. No, you do see some heat there in those places, but you don't see these record highs. And these record highs are set because of this urban heat island. I mean, eliminate this CO2 stuff, and you'll be back down with everyone else. You look in the suburbs, they're always cooler than the cities. Even in the wintertime, you, they're always a degree or two colder. And the further you get, the colder they are. So, I mean, in some places, we have two big cities right next to each other. A good example is New York, where it's just city. They are, get super hot there. It's why it's kind of miserable there. It's why it's muggy. It's not enjoyable in the spring and summer. And all this brings about brings about droughts, and you know you consider heat to be a producer of more severe weather, but actually you know droughts you can eliminate weather because there's it's kind of like the same thing with snow. You know if it gets too cold it won't snow, if it gets too hot it won't rain. It'll just be super stuffy. There will be no movement in the air. It's super hot, so these droughts will be more prevalent. And they will be, um, they will happen more. They will be worse and worse and worse until something is improved about the uh, situation starting at the ground level. And that all goes throughout the whole atmosphere. Is the, all of this um, different types of heat and everything? And heat is a driving factor. That's why you know other planets closer to the sun. Venus is a great example. That's why we, it's not inhabitable. Habitable. Um, is because, you know, it's so hot there. Great example, Mercury, you know, super hot. It is fried to a crisp every single day. 
So, you know, heat strokes among athletes and older people are starting to become more frequent now, especially with younger kids. I mean, people aren't built to handle some heat like this. So there are in the summer, till we can fix this problem, um, splash pad areas. There are cooling um, areas, tents, buildings that are open that can help with this. But since we are in the winter right now, that's not exactly a problem. But it's a, it's different i mean in the summer especially if you live in a big city where it's just the um busyness of every single day people everywhere i mean that all adds up and you know travel and everything take a bus carpool you know all that stuff they say it on the signs and we don't pay attention to it but it's not to be annoying it is for a reason and uh more severe weather actually can be produced out of this. You see it on the radar models, just all of a sudden out of a city, boom, giant supercell. And I mean, storms can split, regroup, or completely change directions after encountering a city. Wind is changed because when the wind hits a uh, area of different temperature, it changes direction. And you know, you can see the highs and the low pressures and the dips in the jet streams, and everything, cold air, hot air, and what that does to the weather. Well, imagine that on a little scale over a few months miles and I mean you're dra drastically changing weather that's why sometimes you get rotating storms that will drop a tornado or two and then it'll like skip over main city and then drop one again messes it up or like it hits a city it's a perfectly fine little tiny innocent rain um, shower and it turns into a tornado it's just a massive system all of a sudden is because when you push air away in a different direction if it's encountering shear at all that's going to rotate it that will make it fold over itself and start spinning and that's what shear does and so there are many ways that we can uh, help to eliminate this but it, they all take time and money which we don't exactly have more on the money side or the time side but we have a little bit more time so we need to start working at ideas and global uh, collaboration to improve um, our climate for these events and that's where climatology comes in and it's much bigger than just some meteorologists reading some data it involves everybody so I mean looking down even some uh, like NASCAR and them you know if it gets too hot tires are melting uh, the rubber you know with friction on the tracks and everything you look at some uh, just driving on the road and everything and you get into a hot car and a great example of all this heat is the, you know the amount of child deaths in hot cars this year it was horrific this past summer and that's a whole nother story about you know remembering to get your kids out of the car this I mean the fact that you, they were in the car maybe for five minutes and that happened and they show you they have on the weather channel a uh, heat in car index or something like that and after like five minutes it's 78 degrees now if you're in a major city it gets up to like 120 in those places and that's 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 a crazy 50 degree change over a few minute period so it kind of just sucks the oxygen out of places it just the moisture is gone so that's why you don't see production of uh, severe weather always is because it kind of strips the atmosphere of anything um, that it has any of the energy so it's crazy what all these are um, creating every single year and these places like farmers and all of them were are getting impacted by uh, record rainfall are now in droughts and droughts are becoming more and more common and a big contributor to uh, the climate change problem are fires fires brought about by droughts and hot air so a great movie interstellar uh, brings about a uh, example of you know the whole earth is on fire they're looking for a way to save the earth well looking at a solution they send people out into space looking for another planet but focusing on the scenes that they are down on earth everything is on fire literally everything it is burning and so you know you gotta pr try to protect earth and you gotta try to make it better for generations to come because it it's not about you it's about everyone in the future and everyone else that you gotta help and it's i mean it's as simple as you know recycling or something like that will help you know we're not destroying the earth so it's a lot of information and it's a lot of uh studies and a lot of people are working on it but support and everything will hopefully come uh, soon and the government is starting to step in on things so hopefully you know we can get this resolved or at least starting in the right direction because everyone's gonna really need some help with this and I mean, it's not, it doesn't sound like a great world to live in if it's just going to be on fire all the time. You know, you don't want your marshmallows burning in the bag. So, hopefully, 
you guys will like today's podcast, and you'll come back again, and we'll watch one and listen to one. Next week, we have uh, two this uh, upcoming week, and then we are going to uh, have only one the week of Thanksgiving. We will have the Monday podcast, uh, and that is two weeks out, I believe, from right now. And we will not have the Friday one or the next Monday one because of Thanksgiving break. We're going to take a quick holiday hiatus, and then we'll be coming back for the rest of the season going through the end of the year. So I want to thank you again, and have a great day. Have a great day.